My name is Arthur. I'm talking about the Pre-Raphaelite artists and their explorations in art. You may know this already, some of you. The Legion of Honor currently has an exhibition of Pre-Raphaelite art, which was a part of what inspired this talk to begin with. If you go to see this, though, please be warned, it is a very dignified presentation <laughs> of the Pre-Raphaelites. Uh, as museums often do, it has a very kind of ennobling, idealized gloss that is used to present the material to the public. I admit this is not something that has ever sat particularly well with me, and I am not alone in that. It turns out the Pre-Raphaelites also did not like the ennobling, idealized gloss over thing. Uh, they had a word for this, the kind of idealized gloss. They called it being sloshy. Uh, one of the glosses that museums often tend to give to artists is to make it seem like these people are completely singular, never before, never again. I'm going to suggest that's not true, and probably if you've been in art school or if you've been 20 years old, you've met people who were kind of like these guys. Uh, by way of introduction, this is Dante Rossetti, the reckless hedonist, followed by John Millet, the sentimental romantic, and our third main character is William Hunt, the weirdly religious guy. Uh, without naming names, I either knew or was these three guys <laughs> when, I, when I was 20. Uh, they met at the Royal Academy of Arts, which was established in 1768, which will be germane in just a moment. And then the, uh, the institution was around for a bit less than 100 years and come 1850, so kind of right as the Victorian era is starting to peak, these three miscreants showed up. Uh, they're called the Pre-Raphaelites because they actually really appreciated the artist Raphael. They just didn't like the fact that his style had been institutionalized and turned into kind of this sloshy standard muck. So here's two portraits by Raphael. The one that's in the orange-brown is actually a self-portrait. Here's what we want to look for. You've got a relatively muted color scheme. The background is not very detailed. The principal subject is the brightest part of the painting, usually in a space that could fit roughly in a triangle, and one of the corners is always darkened. This was the master style that then became the sloshy standard. This guy here, Sir Joshua Reynolds, uh, who our heroes called Sir Sloshua, he was the founder of the Royal Academy of Arts, and he painted in this style all the time, every time. Muted color scheme, the principal figure highlighted, one corner darkened, the backgrounds dulled out, and our guys did not like that at all. Uh, as often happens, the 20-year-old art wackos who had met in school were interested in exploring other ways of doing art. Uh, they really wanted a lot of bright color and a lot of detail. They wanted backgrounds that were more detailed than the foregrounds of the kind of painting that had happened before. This is one of their early works. There's actually more happening in the background than there is in the foreground. They also wanted to explore color, really bright color. While I was at the Legion of Honor taking this picture, there were a couple of guys standing next to me, and one of them said, damn, those are some pink-ass pants. Uh, I was like, yeah, there are, in fact, some pink-ass pants there. They're arguably more attention-grabbing than the principal figures in the painting. Um, our guys were also interested in exploring ideas, not just through art, but through the spoken word. You may be able to see where this is going. They actually had a zine. I am, n <laughs> I am not making this up called The Germ. <laughs> uh, it only... <laughs> It only ran about four issues because nobody wanted to buy it. I was able to find copies online, and I can confirm it's pretty bad. <laughs> um, it promises to be a publication like no other. And then the first, uh, the first article in the first issue is a 30 stanza poem about a beautiful lady called My Beautiful Lady. It's not, <laughs> it is not profound. Uh, they were also interested in exploring uh, holy works, sacred works religion through art in ways that were not strictly sloshy. This piece ended up becoming very famous. This is Jesus in the home of his parents, uh, which made people very, very angry in 1850. I'm going to zoom in on the central figure here. This is the Christ child and uh, Mary. And there was this wonderful, wonderful critique that goes, in the foreground of that carpenter's shop is a hideous, wry-necked, blubbering, red-headed boy. Like, why the hate on redheads? Redheaded boy 
in a bed gown who appears to have received a poke in the hand from a stick. And then the lady is a kneeling woman so horrible in her ugliness that she would stand out from the rest of the company as a monster in the vilest cabaret in France or the lowest gin shop in England. Uh, this is actually in, in uh, sort of art history circles, this is an infamous essay called Old Lamps for New Ones written by Charles Dickens in... <laughs> In June of 1850. Whenever I read this kind of thing, I want to ask, like, the lowest gin shop in England, like, now how do you know that? A <laughs> uh, very quick shout out to the Devonshire Arms, formerly known as the Hobgoblin in London. I have some very fond memories. Research. Ah, research. Uh, the point is that the pre Raphaelites were wildly unpopular until, sort of, from the first few years that they were still students and still trying to get established. And then this guy showed up, John Ruskin, who was a famous geologist and art critic from back during the period of time when that combination made total sense. <laughs> uh, Ruskin really, really liked the work that the Pre-Raphaelites were doing. And he, this is not a direct quote, but he basically said, you people need to get over your damn sloshy selves. This stuff is great, and if you give it a chance, you'll like it a lot. Um, he talked up the Pre-Raphaelites, and the Pre-Raphaelites were duly grateful, and people, like, that was just the trigger that they needed, that the public needed, to stop looking at things in the old, ennobling, idealized way, and to start looking at things fresh. Uh, once they got success, the different members of the Pre-Raphaelites, and there were a lot more than just these three, but these are the three principal, they then started to really zero in and focus on their particular areas of interest. Like, this is the subject matter that I want to explore. Uh, unsurprisingly, Rossetti, our hedonist, really wanted to explore hot chicks. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, he ended up marrying one of his models. They fell very much in love. This is Lizzie Siddle. Uh, they got married. He painted this portrait of her for their wedding. They did art together. Um, yes, uh, get used to that neckline. So they did, uh, they did art together, they were very much in love, they were very much reckless hedonists. Uh, it was a very intense, dramatic, um, there was infidelity and drama and alcohol and drugs and art. And that lifestyle, <laughs> right, that lifestyle um, carries certain risks with it. Lizzie died in 1862 at the age of 32. Uh, back when laudanum was easily available and competent medical assistance was not, that was kind of a thing that happened. Uh, when that occurred, Rossetti really doubled down uh, on the lifestyle. He only made it for another 20 years, but it was just the women that I find the most beautiful all the time, every time. Arguably, the, the most notorious was Jane Morris. I don't know if this neck and jawline does anything for you, but it definitely did something for Rossetti. He painted uh, Jane Morris many times. He often would do multiple versions of the same painting just to explore the neck and jawline more. This is a painting from the exhibit currently up at the Legion of Honor. This is arguably a painting of a neck and jawline with some stuff <laughs> around it. But that was the area that he was going to explore and not sloshy. Uh, he then continued to have the drug and alcohol problems that often go along with that lifestyle, and he perished in 1882 at the not especially ripe old age of 53. He was the first of the three to go. Uh, much more successful was Millet, the sentimental romantic, whose life took a much weirder turn. So you remember the mentor of the group, John Ruskin, the guy who came and said, the kids are all right. Uh, Ruskin was married to this very beautiful woman named Effie. Uh, you can see where this is going, right? Uh, Millet fell in love with Effie, and then and that was very awkward. And then at some point, Effie made it known that although they had been married for five years, she was still a virgin. <laughs> and then Millet said something to her, and we're not clear on exactly what he said, but it was something like, if we were married, I would get you a heavy stick to smack me down with, otherwise I would never stop sexing you up because you're the most beautiful creature on this or any other world. <laughs> And Effie's response was basically, let me see what I can do. <laughs> so she sued for an annulment based on non-consummation of marriage, which was a very real thing at the time. The, so this is one of those details that you will never get from the Legion of Honor. Uh, during the hearing, during the actual court hearing, Ruskin offered to prove his manhood to the court. And, right? and the judge said no, which is kind of heartbreaking to me. Because that script sort of writes itself, indulge me. It's like, well, Mr. Ruskin, would you, 
Would you like to do it here in court with the assistance of counsel, or would you like to come back <laughs> to the judge's private chambers to enter your manhood into evidence? Uh, was not what the judge said. The judge actually said the marriage is annulled, and then the two of them got married and had eight kids. Yeah, and then, that's right, good man of his word. Uh, as sometimes happens with the sentimental romantic, the sentimental romantic type, uh, after he got kids, he discovered the children were really wonderful, and his art clearly turned in the direction of painting kids, which I think is really sweet. Um, his uh, artwork also, uh, you can see this, is, this gets a little bit sloshy. The background doesn't have as much detail. The corners are kind of darkened. He was accused of making his work turn more commercial. I love this. He basically said in uh, response to the accusations of becoming more commercial, yes, I have eight kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he, they lived very happily together. He ended up painting his grandchildren and then passed away in 1892 at the age of 67. Obviously, we've got one more left, uh, Hunt, who had started out as an atheist, kind of, but I think it's just because he was looking for the right form of religion, and then ultimately he included all of them. He absorbed multiple sects of Christianity and was very fond of Judaism, uh, and he painted very colorful, very religious pictures. Um, what, right, whatever associations the rainbow has in modern times, it has always been an object of luminescence and color. That is what it is. And he enjoyed color and luminescence enough to want to incorporate it into his artistic works. Uh, he traveled to Jerusalem to paint this painting. He got actual rabbis on the grounds that if he was going to paint rabbis, he wanted to paint actual rabbis. Also, although it may be hard to see on this screen, the Christ that he has painted here has bronze skin and dark brown curly hair, which was pretty uncommon for that period of time. Uh, his last big work is this one. Um, it's up in the Legion of Honor. This is clearly my favorite painting of the bunch. It's breathtaking. Uh, the detailing in the background is so bright and so dazzling that if you saw this and somebody told you that it's backlit, you would believe them. <laughs> yes, she's definitely wearing a pink ass skirt. Also, uh, fun, yeah, why not? Fun fact, so one of the paintings that's currently up at the Legion of Honor for the uh, Pre-Raphaelite exhibit is a fake. I happen to know. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a, it, is a, it is a reproduction. The Legion of Honor is not uh, very pushy with that fact. They also don't conceal it. But one of the paintings that's up in the Pre-Raphaelite exhibit is a duplicate made with authentic, period-appropriate paints and brushes. And I'm not going to tell you which one. <laughs> but, but, if you go, but if you go, see if you can spot. And it is in, but I, I did deliberately include it in this presentation. So it's one of these. Anyways, uh, well, that's right. I'm trouble. Too bad. So when you hear this, it's, yes, go see it yourselves. It's up until the end of September. So you've got another few weeks. Uh, when you hear the story of the three brash 20-year-olds who are harumphing and talking about how art being done the old way was no good. It reads like a kind of prophecy. Hunt was the one who lived long enough to fulfill that prophecy. Uh, he lived long enough to see the birth of modernism. And sure enough, he harumphed and talked about how kids these days don't know how they're doing art and so forth and so on. But that's, I feel, I feel like he earned it. Anyways, um, I'd like to raise my glass to the weird little details on account of it always has to start somewhere. Cheers. <laughs>